Okay, I'm going to remind everybody to put your microphones back on for the school committee so that when you're ready to speak, it's on and you don't forget. <laughs> um, so I'd like to bring this meeting of the Beverly School Committee back into order. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here, and welcome, Miss Meredith Nato. Um, I hope that you enjoyed your tour through Beverly today. Um, it's nice that the weather cooperated and you were able to do all of that. Before we get down to business, why don't we start by introducing ourselves? And Mr. Milady, if you would start us off. Sure. Hi, I'm John Milady. I'm on the school committee. I represent Ward 4. And I'm Rachel Abel. I'm in Ward 1. I have a fourth and fifth grader in district. Thank you. Hi, Mrs. Nato. Mike Cahill. I'm the mayor and a member of the school committee by definition of being mayor. Thanks. Uh, Paul Goodwin, this is my second term on the school committee, and I've had two boys who went through the entire school system, both in college right now. Congratulations. Thank you. And it's nice to see you again. My name is Chris Silverstein, the chairwoman of the school committee. And like Paul, both of my sons have gone through the Beverly Public Schools, and I represent Ward 3, which is where we're sitting now, this part of the city. Okay. And Kelly Ferretti, Ward 2. I have uh, four children that are currently in the system, a second grader, uh, excuse me, a third grader, a fourth grader, uh, a seventh grader, an eighth grader. Excellent. Lorinda Visnick, I too have four children. Uh, one is a senior in college and he was a product, uh, all my children are products of the Beverly Public Schools. Um, a junior in college, a senior at the high school, and an eighth grader here at the middle school. That was a big quiz. I was like, really nervous <laughs> about that. Um, I, <laughs> and I represent Ward 6. I'm Stephanie Plask. I'm the recording secretary for the school committee, and I also work in the business office. So just as a reminder for everybody, though these interviews are public, uh, members of the public will not be given opportunities to um, speak or ask questions of the candidates. We have more than enough questions for Ms. Dato tonight. <laughs> Um, there are feedback forms that will be available after this if you would like to fill those out. Some of you may have already been at the forum as well and, and have done the same there. Um, and as another reminder, BevCam is taping our interviews this evening and we'll release the videos after they're all completed. They're not live streaming them tonight. They'll be, you can catch up with them after, at least after Thursday, if not after Wednesday, depending on how we do for weather. So, Ms. Nato, thank you for your interest in this position as the superintendent of Beverly Public Schools. Uh, we know that it's been a long day for you, and um, we hope that you found it as rewarding as it was informational. Um, we've heard many wonderful things about you through our screening committee, and we were able to read your resume and learn more about you. And some of us learned about you by being on the screening committee. Some of us had a quick little dinner with you earlier, very quick. Um, and so we hope that this is sort of casual, that we get to know you a little bit better, you get to know our district a little bit better, and we, but we have a total of 15 questions. Okay. So that um, gives us about three to five minutes for each response, um, and I'll do a time check after question number eight so we sort of know where we are. I'm taking a tip from um, was something that John Brackett said that the screening <coughs> committee did, and thank you, Rachel, for, for doing that. Um, so, so the hope is that we engage in dialogue about leadership and what your thoughts are about that and what we're hoping to uh, see as, as our vision for Beverly Public Schools. So um, to start, we have had a chance to look at your application and would you start us off by telling us briefly why Beverly, what brought you here? So I've um, worked in New Hampshire most of my career. Uh, I was in Maine for five years, so that's, that's no surprise to any of you, but I professionally feel like I've kind of been gearing up um, to move to a larger system. And so to do that, you kind of have to leave New Hampshire. Um, there, there aren't a lot of bigger districts to work in um, in, in, in the state. Uh, Beverly, in and of itself, is a place I had heard a bit about, right? Uh, one of my husband has a friend who grew up here, whose mom was a teacher here. I played soccer with a woman who grew up here. Um, so I, I had some of those personal experiences. I'd come to a wedding here. Um, so th those little things. And then uh, when I saw it in the paper, I thought, oh, that's interesting, right? And then I, um, first let me say, 
everything I had heard was really positive, right? Everyone spoke really fondly of the community and of their school experience. And then, um, again, when the posting came up, I thought, oh, bigger district. I've heard good things about this place, so let me do a little digging. And I would say that consistently what I heard in doing some of that digging was, wow, it's a really stable school system. People are really proud of it. It's a very strong community. It really supports education. It's invested um, in the education system for its children. And then I went a little deeper and read um, your strategic plan, goals and objectives, and, and the metrics that are laid out there, the focus areas around um, inclusive practices and social emotional learning, um, innovative practice, and looking at some of the project-based learning pieces that, that you've been exploring. Uh, school safety, really working on um, building out your professional culture and supporting teachers through professional development. Those are all things that really resonated with me and I think um, embody the kinds of values that, that I would want to see in a school system in focusing on all children, uh, putting your resources really towards uh, meeting those goals and, and looking at um, education through an equity lens. And so just as a um, follow-up from your tour today through the district, um, did you come away with any insights or were there any surprises that you'd like to share with us? I don't want to say surprises other than this middle school is an amazing facility. Um, not that that's so. surprising because I, again, had heard great things about it and the, the things I'd seen online, certainly the photographs, um, I can't say they do it justice, but they, but they were okay, gave me a hint. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say that's a surprise. I would say, what did I take away? I saw really passionate teachers um, providing instruction. I saw a fair amount of alignment across things as I traveled um, bet between the schools, um, both at the elementary level where I saw some literacy instruction taking place in one school. I saw some math and science instruction in other schools, but I saw, um, uh, in classrooms, right, similar um, rubrics hanging on walls or uh, questions on the board ac across each of the buildings, essential questions or unit questions. I saw technology being deployed um, on an individual and small group level uh, to really supplement instruction. I saw engaged, excited teachers. I saw student teachers. I saw people... Um, uh, working sort of across disciplines, some co-teaching um, at the high school level. So, so I would say I, what I saw kind of reinforced um, that you're working towards those values that you've articulated. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and we're going to start our real line of questioning with Mr. Milady with question number one. Okay. Hi. So congratulations. This is a, a two-part question. Mm -hmm. I think most of them are, so just brace yourself. Um, so the first part is, if you were to have a 360-degree review, how would those who manage you describe you? And then how would those, the second part is, how would those you manage describe you? Thank you. So I've had the opportunity to do that before, which is great. Um, I would say, uh, in general, I'm probably on both fronts. Um, maybe I'll pull out... Similarity, I'll do similarities first and then maybe pull out the differences between the groups. I would say most people would describe me as hardworking and um, passionate, as empathic and focused on um, children. I would say that um, feedback was generally that I um, take things in fairly quickly. I'm pretty good at reading situations that I am um, comfortable with people, that I am articulate in presenting information. Uh, differences, you know, teachers, I think, um, and, and parents, and uh, I had a little bit of student feedback, not as much, um, you know, see, see things through different lenses, right? So parents felt like um, communication was good, can always be better. Uh, but that information was clear um, uh, and generally timely. I would say that teachers felt like I was available and, vi and visible. Um, I would say um, that the um, school board in my case, school committee in yours, um, would say that I was well prepared, that I gave them information in advance. 
um, that I kind of did my homework on topics, that I had a good command of, of the financials as well as um, the day-to-day -day operations. Um, yeah, that's a quick sketch. Thank you very much. Of course. I'm preparing myself for 30 questions if they're all <laughs> going to be two part. Okay, Mrs. Visnick. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Ms. Nadeau, can you please describe um, in your current role what you have done um, to address the growing social, emotional, and behavioral needs of all students, uh, as, as my um, as John said, as Mr. Malady said, that's a, the first part of a question. And the second part of the question is, <clears throat> um, as you speak to that, can you please speak to, in essence, what has worked what, with what you have found success versus um, some of the things that maybe have not been successful? Sure. So my interest and passion for social emotional learning really goes back to my first job out of college, which was working at a group home with um, I worked primarily with adolescent males, but it was a group home for children with emotional and behavioral challenges, uh, many of whom had been placed there by the state um, for, for various reasons, some abuse and neglect, some um, delinquency, as it, it would have been called at the time. Um, and, and I saw in those young people um, some skill gaps. Right? They didn't have necessarily the tools that they needed to work through a challenging situation. Uh, they didn't have the ability to slow themselves down, get gain control of their emotions before speaking, right? So, so those were things we could act, actually teach and work on. Um, I started out as an English language arts teacher, but I transitioned into special education um, because I had found that I was somewhat effective at helping to provide young people with, with those tools and equipping them with the, those social emotional skills. Um, in my current district, we took a look at some of our social emotional learning needs and tried to look at kind of across the board what are some potential solutions. We have um, responsive classroom. Um, in most of our classrooms, we still have a few teachers who haven't had full training. So I would say it's it, um, the depth of it varies a little bit from classroom to classroom. But we were finding um, that teachers were struggling to provide direct instruction on some of those um, common challenges that they were seeing and, and weren't necessarily prepared for or trained or equipped to um, deliver that instruction because they didn't know all of the points maybe that needed to be attached to it. And one guidance counselor wasn't going to be able to do that for 540 students. Right, So we needed a, some tools that would help us to meet those needs in a more scalable way. Um, we looked at a, um, a basically digital um, delivery system for a program called Rethink Education, which is based on the CASEL standards, the Center for Applied Social Emotional Learning. Um, and Tools available to us included professional development options. Um, some of the folks doing a lot of the ground level work around social emotional learning are our support staff members, our paraprofessionals, who have very limited professional development time built into their schedule. So we needed to be able to kind of carve out time and provide tools that, that they could access kind of when they had some downtime um, and that were available to them really for on-demand learning. We also wanted a parent component as a part of our tool, so um, that's a part of, of this particular program. We wanted lessons that could be kind of customized for classrooms but that were ready to deliver. So um, again, this, this program has about 20 minute um, classroom lessons uh, for a K2 grade spans, three, five, six, eight, and nine, 12. It also had um, what I would refer to as a tiered lesson, so lessons that were for um, kind of general students who would be able to kind of easily access and, and process that information, understand the vocabulary, and then um, some tiered instruction that might pre-teach some of the vocabulary, a allow access um, um, to students who might struggle with, with the core content um, or the general tiered level. So that, that was kind of the tool um, that we took, and then I started to write down the second part of your question and got too excited to answer the first part. That's all right. Uh, it was really 
um, what were some of the things that oh, worked? Oh, what worked and what didn't. didn't. So, so we've been piloting it this year. Um, we've really focused on rolling it out in our pre-K, um, as well as with some of our special education teachers, and then we have some pilot teachers at different grade levels. So that's really been our focus. Um, what has worked? Well, I would say the, the pilot approach has been successful in that um, people haven't been forced to do it, and it's allowing us to get a, a better handle on what some of the challenges and pitfalls are. Um, what what hasn't worked? Um, we don't really have a point person who knows the ins and outs of of um, these tools entirely. So we are looking at can one of our teacher leaders potentially shift into this role moving forward, so that there is sort of one person who can be more of a go-to. Um, as it stands, we've had to sort of divide that up. And we are definitely have a lot of questions. Very quickly, yes or no, is there a trauma-informed piece of that program? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really builds on that work. And I would say it's, um, it, it's bringing to the work and understanding that, that students come to the table with, a, with very different histories. Um, and in the professional development component, there's more depth on that. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, Mayor Cahill. Thank you, Mrs. Nadeau. I've got the next question. Okay. Um, Given the cyclical nature of our economy, it is entirely possible that a more difficult economic time may come to pass during our next superintendent's tenure. Please explain how you would help guide the Beverly Public School District through such a time. So I think um, when you've worked in education, you kind of are always expecting the other shoe to drop. <laughs> um, so, so I think that's just the reality of, of what we've lived with in education for decades, right? It's, and, and I'm sure as a mayor, you've, you've experienced the same. Um, I think part of that is really good stewardship of your resources on an annual basis. It's um, building your reserves to um, the extent that you can. Um, you know, if you have savings in a particular fiscal year and you have mechanisms like a revolving account that you can um, put some funding into, it's it's being able to to put some of those monies away for a rainy day. Um, it's also doing um, pretty good forecasting um, in advance. So looking at your facilities and capital needs up front, kind of knowing what's on the horizon so that you're not getting big surprises, um, and then. You know, uh, un unfortunately, sometimes you you have to make reductions in places that are going to be painful. Um, so I think you know that process of leading people through that work is challenging. But but the best you can do with that is to be really open and honest about the challenges that you face. Invite people into the conversation. Um, gather the information propose a solution and um, invite people again to kind of weigh in on that proposal and adjust it if you need to but but at the end of the day if you're going to have to make cutbacks um, which which is again no one's idea of a good time um, you want people at least to be informed about that as much in advance as as possible great thank you I'm up again okay. um, so special education, which you've spoken about a little bit already, is a challenge because of the complex rules, the service needs um, of the students, and the parent concerns. So when you assess the effectiveness of a, a special ed program, what specifically are you looking for? Mm -hmm. So you can gather data on lots of different fronts, right? Um, data comes in the form of parent feedback. Data comes in the form of student outcomes. Data comes in students um, meeting their IEP goals and objectives. Those are all metrics that you would want to take a look at as, as a part of that process. Um, it's also... Uh, kind of measuring have we provided um, the professional development that needed to be provided, right? Sometimes the outcomes aren't there, but it's because we haven't done the upfront work um, to, to meet those objectives. Um, sometimes we have to kind of peel apart that, that data a little bit more. Um, to understand if we're really measuring what we think we're trying to accomplish. Um, because sometimes we paint overly broad um, pictures of, of, of what it is we're trying to, to see. And then we are somewhat obscured. The data can be somewhat obscured um, because we haven't been clear enough about what it is we're trying to measure, right? We see that as, as classroom teachers. You're, yes, you really want to assess if the student understands or can apply 
excellent critical thinking skills, but what you actually asked them to do was following, you know, a particular model that you've laid out. So you, you haven't really assessed that then. Um, but, you know, special education students are also all individual, right? Um, but as you look at programs, for example, you have uh, the AIM program, which is uh, an ABA or um, Applied Behavioral Analysis program. In looking at that program, are referrals increasing or decreasing? Are students being exited from that program, having met goals and objectives, and then um, moving towards um, uh, more inclusive settings? Are they spending greater amounts of time in the general education setting? I mean, I, those are just some samples, but I, I, again, I think it's sort of what question are you trying to answer, right? And then getting really specific about the data that's available to you and analyzing it in a systematic, thoughtful way. Great, thank you. Um, Mrs. Abel, you're up. Sure. Um, how would you develop a strategy for improvement for the district and ensure it addresses the priorities that you've obviously had a chance to look at? And could you give us an example of a framework or a strategy that you've employed to support um, the strategic improvement plans? Sure. Uh, so in Cape Elizabeth, we developed a strategic plan um, based on some initial mission and vision work. I sometimes put those two words together. <laughs> Paused myself, but mission and vision work, um, and then a work with a group of stakeholders to develop, like you have some some goal statements. So then, um, once we had sort of laid out some of the objectives underneath that, which again you've done, we set about setting some measurable <sighs> objectives to look at exactly that. Um, that work included our administrators primarily to sort of establish what those metrics were with input. Um, from their faculty. So administrators kind of drafted some things, took them to faculty for input and feedback, made adjustments, and then brought those forward. We then as a team, once we as an administrative team had kind of said, yes, these make sense, we took them to the school committee for approval. Um, and then we reported on those on an ongoing basis. So we had formal reports to the board on, say, goal two, you know, every other month, and goal one, maybe every other month. Um, you know, providing an annual report to the community as well as a part of that. So, so once you sort of establish what you got to measure, you got to measure it. <laughs> um, sometimes you have to make adjustments, right? Sometimes the goal that you set is really ambitious, and you have to go back and make adjustments to your timeline. Or um, you've had a budgetary <laughs> downturn, and and the resources that you expected to have available to you are no longer there. So you, it's it's still a, a fluid document to some degree, but essentially it's kind of our commitment, right? This is this is what we're pledging to do and sort of laying out there to the community. This is what we expect to accomplish, and here's how we're going to tell you whether or not we're meeting that. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Goodwood. Thank you. Hi. So as superintendent, how would you work to recruit and retain excellent educators to the Beverly Public School System? Mm. So I think one way that you're doing that already is by providing a really strong salary and comp salary and benefits package, right? And um, working collaboratively to to build um, strong collective bargaining um, agreements and relationships with with your unions. Um, I think you also provide teachers with great opportunities for professional development and professional growth, and that's important. Um, and it can't be everyone doing the same thing, right? <laughs> it has to be diverse opportunities for people because we're not all the same as learners. Um, I think um, one of the conversations that has come up here is do we have sort of a, uh, over the course of my day was do we have the same diversity represented in our faculty that we have in our student population um, to recruit a more diverse faculty, you have to go to places where there's greater diversity and you have to make a concerted effort to do that. Um, that can be a challenge for sure, but but if you but if you don't kind of focus those efforts and marshal, you know, marshal those attempts, you're not going to accomplish it. So so that's another way, reaching out to um, you know, or, urban settings, to universities that are um, situated in more diverse places. Um, I think you also provide opportunities for um, teachers to advance, perhaps, in ways in their career to serve as mentors to oversee student teachers. Uh, you make sure they have a voice, right, on, on the issues that matter to them, curriculum and instruction. 
um, that they are part of shaping um, the experience of, of students in their schools because that's what they're living every day. So that's, that's what I've got. Great, thank you. Sure. Okay, Mrs. Ferretti. Thank you. Uh, I want to first just take a breath and thank yeah. you. Thank for, you. And recognize that literally you're in your 12th hour of interviewing today. <laughs> it's a long day. Uh, my question is a, a little different. It's um, what is the, the best mistake you've ever made? And, and by that I mean in our personal and professional lives, sometimes we make choices that we think are going to be great and they end up not so great. Mm -hmm. And we have a finite amount of time to readjust and decide what our next step is. Do you have an example in your professional career? Sure. Um, yeah, which one? I know. Right. <laughs> the best mistake. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think they're all great in a way, right? They we learn from every mistake that we make. So sorting out which which is my best is a little challenging right now. Yeah. Hmm. My best one was was buying a, a uh, natural gas grill when we actually intended to buy a propane grill, and oh. <laughs> and halfway yeah. through assembling it, realizing the right? mistake. But now I have a natural gas grill yeah and it's great <laughs> yeah. so I mean I think at a classroom level that's a daily experience sure. right um, you're you're constantly in the position of well that didn't go quite as I intended and adjusting and and um, reevaluating along the way I think um, I think probably the um, best example in this this came up a little bit in my last conversation was around um, full day kindergarten when we moved from a half day program to a full day program in Cape Elizabeth and um, the way that um, was kind of determined that we were going to do that was to offer a pilot full day program that was open via lottery. Um, and of course everyone wanted to be in the lottery for a full day program and so uh, I think I underestimated um, the degree to which um, that that or or the extent to which that was going to create an uproar um, in the community, and so uh, found myself in you know public meetings because it was pretty clear that boy we need to invite people into this conversation and and this had all gone through the school committee, let me be very clear, oh. um, they, they, they were on board with this piece, but I, I think I was a little naive in thinking that, well, they've only got half day now, so great, now some people have a chance at full day. Um, but it became sort of very controversial, very competitive, and so you, you find yourself sort of sitting in a meeting saying, you know, I, I'm sorry, I didn't expect that. Um, but I learned um, to do a kind of better job taking the community pulse before something like that, right? I, yeah. I was, I think, a second year superintendent at the time, right? It had a good first year. I thought, right, I know this community, <laughs> but, but you don't, right? And you can't make that assumption. And I think that that was the lesson and, again, probably the best mistake in yeah. terms of um, making me really be attuned to I don't know. I don't know the community. I don't speak for the community, and I really have to get their input on major on a major thing like that. Right. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we are at a time check and it is 7:43. So you're doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're cruising right along. It looks like we may actually make it through all these questions. So, Mr. Malady, hey. carry on. Hey. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, you're not going to believe it. This question is actually about free full day kindergarten. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't trigger anything for you. No, no. I'll be fine. So, currently uh, Beverly does not have free full day kindergarten. Right. So what is your personal opinion on communities providing the service to its residents? And then the next question, the harder one, is this something that you would pursue? So this just came up um, in the conversation with parents a little bit before. So um, when we made this transition, and again, school committee was on board with this transition, um, one of the comments that was made was, you know, Nobody would think it was a great idea to go to a half-day senior year, and yet we have half-day kindergarten. So why aren't we thinking differently about the way we utilize our resources? 
And um, that frame, I think, really helped spark some conversation. Uh, we know that the investment in early childhood learning, pre-K and K, um, pays for itself over time in the um, outcomes of students academically as well as social behavioral uh, metrics. So is it something I would support? Certainly. When is the right time to make that move? You know, that, that's the harder question and isn't one that rests solely with, with the superintendent. You know, that, that really is an issue that the school committee has to wrestle with. There are, there are trade-offs and choices unless you have um, a large amount of dollars to infuse into your budget. And again, you know, if you're really looking at longer-term planning, you may know that there are some things that, you know, uh, capital, you may have a year where there aren't any major capital expenses planned. Is that a year that you make that introduction? Uh, again, I'm not in a position to, to speak to that timing of it now, but yes, it is something I would support um, because I've, I've seen, um, you know, the research, not just my own view, but I've seen the research on um, how it supports children. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Visnick. Thank you, Madam President. <coughs> Ms. Nadeau, <clears throat> this question is um, incredibly uh, personal to me. I believe we have an, uh, <clears throat> a pressing need in our community relative to the achievement gap. Um, and I, I hope you would know, based on some of the research that you've done, that our gap is <clears throat> based more on socioeconomic mm -hmm. status than, than race or any of the other subgroups. So I've made this topic my personal priority. Uh, last summer, I took time off work to attend an accelerated week-long course at Harvard on this topic of closing the achievement gap. Over the course of that week, I was able to listen to educators and administrators from around the globe and <clears throat> talk about the issues and various solutions. So my question to you based on, on, on this topic is, what practices are you aware of, uh, especially if you have first-hand experience, that could be replicated here in Beverly? Um, to try to help us close our achievement gap. Uh, you're probably familiar with Eric Jensen's work, uh, Teaching with Poverty in Mind, um, and, and there are some strategies really mapped out in there that, that can be, I think, very effective, um, and, and really, particularly at the classroom level. Um, it's something I've used as a book study um, with teachers. Um, in the past, so that's that's one avenue, right? Is is helping teachers understand what some of the challenges are that our, our socioeconomically disadvantaged students are encountering. Um, the the other piece of that, too, I think, is really making sure people see and understand the data. I think it gets obscured sometimes in our our focus on data that we don't always sort of highlight that need and recognize um, the number of students that are impacted, right? In your community, it's about one in every four children. So really helping teachers understand that represents five or six students in my classroom. I think teachers do know that. Um, at, a, at a gut level, but again, seeing that presented to you in a different way in terms of the outcomes, I think uh, speaks, to, speaks to educators sometimes in a different way. Um, I think that one of, um, one of the ways we do that, again, is with early <laughs> um, intervention, right, with really investing in resources for making sure children have access to quality, not only K, but ideally pre-K. Um, ways we have done that, um, partnering with our recreation department to provide some um, parent trainings and summer learning opportunities um, for children. We have partnered with um, preschool and daycare folks across um, our community to kind of look at uh, tools and strategies that they can utilize in in preparing students who are coming into our schools. We've we've created um, slots. We in in Cape Elizabeth we set aside um, spaces in our pre K program um, that were uh, in that case shared through sort of some some town um, 
funds that were in an account specifically to support families in need, as well as some school district funds to make sure that we were providing some spaces where children would have access to preschool who might not otherwise have had that opportunity. We did um, some targeted um, outreach to parents um, through our, in part through our Title I programs and Title I funds. We offered summer learning opportunities. We partnered with the town library um, to, to incentivize some summer reading. So that, that's a smattering of things. Um, but I, I, again, I think you have to kind of, each community has slightly different pieces, right? That the <clears throat> needs may be the same and that they're socioeconomically disadvantaged, but where you reach them, how you reach them, um, some, of those, some of those needs vary a bit from community to community. Um, in my current community, we have um, some children who are living with um, non-parent caregivers. And so uh, their needs, maybe as grandparents caring for a, a grandchild, are different. And so we have to be mindful, again, of, of some of those pieces in, in terms of support and resources we provide. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, Mayor Cahill, back to you. Thank you, Madam President. Ms. Nadeau, um, given the opportunity to lead the Beverly Public Schools, how would you ensure consistency of instruction throughout the district <laughs> Said another way, instruction that reliably and effectively delivers the district's curriculum. So thank you for the question. One of the things that you are already doing is really focusing on curricular alignment. Uh, so that that's an important piece of that work, and particularly across the transitions um, from elementary to middle and middle to high. I would add from pre-K to elementary as well. Um, I think I think you also have to be really looking at at your data. What are those outcomes? Where do we have gaps? Uh, diving a little bit more deeply into the released questions and looking at some of the trends and patterns that we see. Uh, look, visiting classrooms. Um, administrators today talked a bit about uh, learning walks that they're doing and that teachers are doing. If you're looking, um, as, as I, I kind of do out of habit, right, uh, for similar practices across classrooms, people have to know that. People have to be trained on what those things are that you're looking for so that they can walk into any classroom and know, oh, right, the essential questions on the board. If I ask any student in that classroom, can they tell me what they're learning? Pretty much yes, right? So, so those are um, some of the other ways. Uh, I think you... Um, also have to look at what's what's happening in terms of the, the formative work in classrooms, right? Ultimately, we're focused on the summative, but you've got to go back to the formative. If we're not meeting the expectations on the summatives, then are the kinds of things we're doing along the way adequate? And if not, how can we make shifts to those so they're really preparing students to better um, respond on those more summative assessments, the final assessments? Um, we have no shortage of data in schools today, <laughs> um, and, and all that assessment data is very useful, but it's one piece. And again, I think you have to then go and confirm that in spending time in classrooms, seeing the instruction that's delivered. Uh, you've got coaches in place, literacy and mathematics coaches. They're people who should be helping um, to examine those practices and look for that continuity. But every teacher ought to have... Um, the ability to walk into someone else's classroom and look for some of those same things because it makes it better at analyzing our own practice. And, and that's ultimately what's gonna help improve outcomes for kids. Thank you. My turn again. Okay. Um, so what do you think the important aspects or characteristics of a successful relationship between the superintendent and the school committee is? And how do you plan to keep the school committee informed? So I think, first of all, it's, it's knowing that there's, uh, there are open channels for communication and agreeing to what those parameters are up front, right, kind of early on in the process. Um, some places have all communication funneled through the school committee chair. Some places have 
every school committee member is copied on every communication that comes forward. So it would be kind of establishing what those expectations are. Um, one, of, one of the things that I found helpful is identifying what are the things you need to know about as soon as they happen, right? Because everybody may have different expectations about that. And so not being a mind reader, I try to ask that question um, so that, that there can be a shared understanding. Uh, I think the other piece is kind of revisiting those pieces, having periodic retreats um, where we can kind of check in on those things, having the school board, uh, school committee in your case, but school board in my prior experience, um, have the opportunity to provide feedback to me is another way that you kind of make sure communication is working. Um, and whether that's you know more formalized or more informal, knowing that that, that opportunity to, to give that feedback is there and will be appreciated and respected matters. Um, in terms of keeping the school committee informed, I have um, uh, had a practice initially in Cape Elizabeth. Part of, part of what we did was to, I would send out kind of a weekly update from the superintendent's office just to the school committee, kinds of things that had come up or that we were working on. Um, uh, as my chair changed, that, that practice changed a little bit, but um, that's, that's one way that you might do that. I think it's, you know, uh, I, every school committee meeting, I assume, superintendent provides an update on, on different things. Generally, again, those were sent out ahead of time with the agenda packets, just so you'd know the kinds of things, excuse me, that, that we were working on or that had come up over the last couple of weeks in your case. I would say those are probably the, the ones that come to mind. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mrs. Abel. Sure. As superintendent, what steps would you take to get to know the community better and become the approachable, engaging, and visible education leader in our city? Mm -hmm. So in talking with folks earlier today, similar question came up, right? I think um, initially stepping into a community, oh, someone uh, in the context was someone had asked me, what will you do, you know, what changes will you make in your first, um, you know, first year in, in Beverly? And I said, hang on, I've been here about six hours at this point. Uh, that's not a question I can answer. But the way that you begin to get a sense of a community is not just from a day like this, but really from taking time to listen and meet with people. And I really think that would be, you know, kind of the first few months on the job, uh, mm -hmm. making sure to meet with constituent groups, sitting with individuals, allowing parents and and teachers and administrators to schedule time to come in and sit down with me. Um, having for myself some sort of common questions to ask those different groups of people, but also allowing them to share those issues and concerns or experiences that they have had that they think I, I need to hear about. Um, I, I think people will generally find you <laughs> um, to share some of those things. I think it's also, you know, making sure that you're not just asking the obvious groups, right? So not just asking um, the Parent Teacher Association for input. Well, that's really important. You might also have to um, go to the local daycare provider and find out, um, you know, if, if some of those parents um, who may not be PTA members would be interested in scheduling a meeting um, or that with the child care provider him or herself. Um, hairdressers and barbers get a lot of information. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um, so, so again, I think you have to kind of reach broadly to invite people in and have those conversations. And I think you also have to be kind of visible around the community. So, um, you know, be, being at the football game and being approachable and allowing people to, to talk to you about their questions or issues, um, going to a concert, allowing people to talk to you about their questions or issues, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not really good about going out to lunch um, during the work week, but, but again, making time for some of those things, being at community events, right, being at the um, Education Foundation's fundraiser, um, you know, all of those things matter um, in getting to know a community. On the school side, clearly it's being in the schools, right? You can hear a lot, but you have to see some things as well for yourself. Um, and, you know, 
learn from what's happening in those particular pockets. So I, I would try to be out there, try to be inviting people in for conversation and, and making myself available and as approachable as I can be. I am who I am. This is what I look like. <laughs> if that's off-putting, I can't help it. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Goodwin. Thank you. Hi, right, Ms. Nato. In your opinion, what is the most effective way to use technology in a school district like Beverly? So, so the, the presumption there is that there's one way, um, and, and I think like with many of my answers, there's not one way, right? I, I think it's to use it as a tool, and it depends on what it is you're trying to teach. It might be great for some research if you're doing a, a, a history project. It might be a great way to kind of showcase what you've learned as, and use it as a creation tool um, if you've been doing a, a science learning, right? And you can showcase all of that. It might be um, a good way to communicate with a wider audience um, on a writing piece, for example. So I, I think its use is really dependent on the purpose of, of the lesson, the purpose of um, what we're trying to ask students to do. Uh, it's also a way that we can augment learning. Um, in way that you know before we would maybe do with some supplemental worksheets or a supplemental um, some extra reading materials, right, or some challenge problems that we might put in a folder. Now we can deliver those um, to students almost instantaneously, and they can get really quick, effective feedback instead of waiting for the teacher to um, correct that sheet that they've tucked in a folder that's sitting on on top of the desk that maybe the teacher will be able to get to, you know, that night or the next day. Uh, so those are some of the ways. And I think our students are going to continue to find more and more ways to use that tool. And we also have to be open to those opportunities because not having grown up with them, we sometimes do not see um, all of the ways that they can be beneficial. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm going to do a 180 on that question with my second part of the question, and just a lot of time we hear about too much screen time. So how would you explain to a parent about the use of technology in the schools and how um, children should balance that in their lives? Sure. So I think, again, it's about sort of purposeful use of technology and, in, and, and technology that is, uh, that we're using it for a reason that's going to drive an outcome. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I have 10 and 12 year old daughters, right? They would spend unlimited time on screens if they could, right? But but my job as a parent is to help monitor that, restrict that, make it meaningful and purposeful. Sometimes, right, we build in some room for fun, right, just to watch a ball game or, or watch a movie together, but that's not all the time. And the same thing is true in the classroom. <coughs> it's my job as the educator to kind of manage that learning environment. And it's not the only, technology is certainly not the only way I'm ever providing opportunities for students to learn and grow, but it's a balancing act because sometimes what they can do working, um, you know, with that, with Gigi, <laughs> right, in ST Math, um, can, can replace practice that they might be doing in another way that wouldn't give them that same level of feedback and stimulate their growth and learning. So it's, it's helping parents understand that we as educators are making those same kinds of decisions that they make and, try, and are really trying to be very mindful of, you know, it's, it's not a, it's, not a placebo, it's not a pacifier, it's really a purposeful educational tool that we use selectively. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And this is Freddie. All right, last question. Well, <laughs> yes, almost. 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 Oh. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> well, getting there. Yes. Yeah. So, um, how would you, uh, what is your practice in evaluating your uh, administrative staff that reports to you, and, and what is your expectation in staff beyond that and in their evaluation okay and then to piggyback onto that just how would you handle a uh, staff that is not performing their duties to the standard that they should be so for me the work around supervising and evaluating administrators comes <coughs> really generally out of a goal setting process, right? So working with them around what are some of their professional goals. Um, as a person coming in, I'd be reading prior evaluations most likely, right? Because it gives me a baseline. 
Um, just like as a teacher, I don't think that's always the full story, right? But it, but it gives me some information. And so I would do my homework and kind of be prepared by doing that. And then I want to meet with that administrator and talk about what their professional goals are, what are the things they're working on in their schools, craft those into some goal statements. And then we're going to check in on how those are going. How are we measuring that? What's working? What's not working? Where might we need some additional support? Uh, so I think like every supervision evaluation process, it's really more of a, <coughs> a coaching conversation right around, it's focused on growth and that's, that's true all the way down the line. Um, and I, I would expect to see a somewhat similar process right across, sure. across that chain, sure. right? From administrators or from principals to assistant principals, from <coughs> principals and assistant principals to teachers, um, from teachers to paraprofessionals. Um, in terms of when people aren't meeting those performance expectations, well, first of all, you have to show them and tell them that, right? Okay. In, in a, a straightforward way. Um, those conversations aren't easy, right? Sometimes people know that it's coming, right? Because they're realizing, whew, I'm really struggling with this piece. I haven't um, arrived at where I thought I would. Uh, but, but sometimes those conversations are more challenging because people aren't seeing things the same way. So I think sort of you know, prefacing that conversation with the fact that this could be a difficult conversation and we may not see this the same way, I think hope helps to open up that dialogue. I think when um, there are clear areas that aren't meeting our expectations, and, and I'm not talking about extreme examples here, right, where there's a right. major safety or, yeah. or concern or um, legal violation, um, but I think we then have to give some really clear expectations for how someone can improve that performance and, and what we're looking for um, at the end of the day. And then it's our job to also try to provide some support to help people meet those expectations if they don't have the tools or skills, right? That might be attending a workshop, for example. Um, and at the end of the day, again, we're going to check back in, right? Did we, did we ultimately meet those expectations? Um, did I provide the support that I pledged to provide, or did I drop the ball, right? And, and again, kind of working through that process. I think, you know, we professionals certainly carry responsibility for themselves, but I think as educational leaders that part of our responsibility is also to model um, uh, the same expectations for growth and learning that we hold for students and to provide people the support and tools to progress. Um, and if at the end of the day we, we feel like uh, I can go to sleep at night saying I did, you know, the five things I promised to do and yet we're still not able to get there, then we have to have the conversation about someone moving on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for yes. spending all this time with us today and the sort of whirlwind tour of, of <laughs> Beverly. And thank you for discussing your professional experience and your approaches to educational leadership. We really appreciate your time today. Um, I do have um, two things now. At this time, do you have any questions for us? And would you like to take a moment and leave us with a closing statement? So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions Great. first, if that's okay. Absolutely. And then I'll decide on a question. <laughs> um, so, so I guess I would ask you first, um, as, as school committee members, what are um, the things that you're most proud of about your school district? And then what are the things that, that keep you awake at night? Um, you know, I heard um, closing that achievement gap as, a, as an example. But, but again, on an, on an individual level, I'd love to hear that. Do you want to hear from everybody or if, if people to the extent that people are comfortable sharing that? <laughs> okay, thanks. I have one one thing that comes to mind when you say, "What are we most proud of?" Our teachers. I mean, there, we couldn't really have a, a better group throughout the whole from right from pre-K all the way up through high school. Excellent. I think that would be the first thing that comes to my mind when I'm most proud of. Mayor okay, Cahill. I'll agree with that and piggyback on it a bit. Um, when we talk about our teachers, we're obviously talking about all of our, uh, all of our staff, and it's it's not just instruction; it's the commitment to the kids, 
it's the commitment to innovation and moving us forward. Uh, it's the strength that we've, we've seen developed in our curriculum. Um, the embrace of project-based learning, the embrace of, of, of technology, the, the, the things that you were just asked about in terms of technology, I see a lot of the, you know, the right balances and the right focuses. Um, so really, th there's a lot that's in place that has us feeling our district is just on this, you know, on this trajectory um, to continued excellency. Uh, so I think, I think just really a, a great feeling about the people who work every day with our, with our kids, the people who uh, run our schools. Just right on through. We got several of them right over there. Yes. This is Abel. Sure, and, and to piggyback on what the mayor said as well, um, I think that our school community partners well with the larger city community, and I think that's evidenced through a lot of the charitable work that our um, or different organizations do to, to benefit um, the homeless with the Polar Plunge or the Mom Ball or any number of those uh, sort of traditional community um, engagement opportunities. I think we are modeling to our young students what it means to be part of a community and to care. So I think we can see that outside the school as well as inside. Excellent. Mr. Goodwin. Thank you. Um, so at our high school graduation this past year, the high school principal during her speech got up and asked the student body to stand up um, and they had participated in a sport or participated in a concert or the robotics club or um, in choral. Um, so my big thing that I like about Beverly is just the diversity of opportunities we give our kids both within the classrooms and the extracurricular outside of the classrooms because I think that's a big part of education as well. Um, so that's what I really enjoy in having um, two boys go through the whole system and see how involved they were both within the classroom and um, especially outside um, in the sports fields. Um, I just see how much they gravitated towards that and how much that uh, made them look forward to go to school. Um, but the thing I worry about most is the kids who didn't stand up for any of those things during the graduation, and that was a little disheartening um, to see and wonder why um, they didn't stand up. This is Visnik. Uh, so lest, lest I sound like the negative Nelly of the group, um, you're absolutely right. What, the question that I chose um, to ask you is what keeps me up at night. So because we are such a caring community, we're a very welcoming community, um, we have all kinds of um, families here, and our population continues to shift. And it's a good thing, but what keeps me up at night is whether I'm giving all my awesome teachers and administrators enough tools. Am I giving them enough um, professional development? Are they a trauma-informed classroom? Um, do they have enough support staff, or is their teacher ratio low enough to handle the fact that one in every five children is suffering some kind of anxiety? Um, so that's, at the end of the day, comes down to money. Really, at the end of the day, it always comes down to money. And, and so I don't, um, you heard some other people talk about staff retention and ask you some questions around that. And I would not want to lose, um, I cannot name a teacher. And in between the four of his Nick children, we've, I think, had all of them. I cannot name a teacher that I would say, yeah, there's the door, get going. Um, so I don't want to lose a single member of the staff. But at the same time, I feel like we are continuing to demand more and more out of them. And um, I need to feel better about the support that we give them um, across the spectrum based on the composition of their classrooms. Thank you. So you're going to hear from all of us. Um, <laughs> and I'm the senior school committee member here, and so I've seen a lot. And I've seen, uh, you know, we've been through some economic downturns where we've had to make some really difficult decisions. And um, the prospect of that keeps me up at night sort of based on the political climate <coughs> that we're living in right now and based on the, the fact that for the past number of years we've enjoyed an increase in our school budget that has allowed us to do a lot. Not exactly what we'd like to do. Um, you know, there's always, I feel like in the years that we were cutting, 
we're still trying to make tracks back to where we were before. Um, there are still things that, you know, I would like to see us have back in the district that we lost. Um, because I'm so old, some of them aren't even remembered by people who, you know, it's a new generation every every couple of years, right? So, so that, that sort of keeps me, well, that does keep me up at night. Um, the other thing that really keeps me up at night is um, everybody's safety in our school buildings. And it just feels like, gosh, almost every other day there's a, a really tragic thing happening in our country. And, um, you know, how much do you put a bubble around the students and the staff? Um, you can only do so much within your physical plant. What can you do out on the soccer field? What can you do when people are just out of the general community? Um, so that stuff is really more scary to me than anything else. Um, everybody's safety, because if if people don't feel safe where they're working and where they're learning, the, all the learning and the teaching that happens takes a back seat until everybody does feel like their basic needs are met. Whether it's, you know, they're they're um, underprivileged and they're not getting what they need at home for for food and other resources. Um, or if they're here feeling like something could happen at any moment. Um, so there is a lot of good work going on that we should be proud of. Our teachers are working really hard with, you know, connecting with students and just making sure that students um, have their needs met. And like Mrs. A. Bell talked about, our community is fabulous about pitching in and, you know, sort of wrapping around our students all together. So we have a lot to be proud of. We have so many, I, I was amazed when I sat and counted our sports programs. And, you know, when I, when I use my old knowledge and say, you know, um, we decided to institute fees so we could keep programs in Beverly. When I looked back at other districts and I said, we have 52 sports programs, that's amazing. You know, we have a fabulous music program. We have art that's just flying off the, the radar and, good things for kids to participate in in during the school day and after the school day we can always do better like any organization um but yeah that's where i'm at with that question i was hoping to hide in the background uh, <laughs> I, was, I haven't been to therapy in a while so this would be good what keeps me <laughs> what keeps me up at night is the um is that are those unknowns right so we're we're dealing with a generation of students who are growing up where you know violence in schools um, are somewhat normalized. We have an opioid epidemic where we have potentially the, the largest generation of children being raised by grandparents. So, um, you know, those are things that we, we try to protect our kids and to help our kids. Uh, and that, that to me is, you know, scary as a parent and as a teacher. Um, but I'll end on the happy Miss America thing would makes Beverly great. <laughs> um, we have a very dedicated school committee and staff in the schools and city councilors and there are times where you know we don't always play this nice but we're playing nice right now but everyone wants to make the city great we just disagree on how to make the city great and i think that's something that makes this place very special a lot of family a lot of people leave and they come back to raise their families here mm -hmm. and that's something that's pretty spectacular about beverly okay. and thank you madam president um a couple of me too's on the concerns of, you know, school security and safety, the safety of our kids and our staff is at the foremost of all of our thinking uh, day in and day out. Um, and in terms, of, in terms of our kids and what we hope they take from their experience as Beverly public school kids, whether they go through to graduation or, or here with us and, and move somewhere else during their time. Um, and and this, really, this really is I think a different way of saying some of what's been already said. Um, we need for our kids to develop strong, resilient selves, right? And a big part of it is developing skills that that they can take and feel good about and they can utilize. And a big part of it is um, the social emotional piece. And you know, broken people struggle in life and helping our kids since we have them, right? And we have both an opportunity, uh, a responsibility with them and a great opportunity to try to make their time with us time that helps them develop that sense of self, those strategies, those skills, and that belief in themselves so that they have a greater chance for success moving through life. 
Oh, and I want to finish on a happy note. <laughs> we talked about our staff, and, and we've, we've talked about the community and, and parents, and we really have some fantastic parents in this district, uh, both as individuals and how they support all that our teachers and principals and superintendents uh, do and what, and what we try to do, uh, and also in the way they band together to make resources available uh, and bring greater, uh, greater opportunities into our schools for our kids and our, and our faculty. Do I have time for one more? Or are you, you sure do? Yeah. Okay. So uh, my next question, which for me just helps um, me to know a little bit about what drives you in this work, but what's something that maybe stands out in either your own educational experience or educational experience perhaps of, of one of your children or a loved one that really um, helped shape your views about education and, and the work that you do here? Huh. Mrs. Okay. Friday. Sure, I have, I have a, a million kids of my own to choose from, so. <laughs> um, but I think having four kids in the system and, and also before I became a school committee member, I did some substitute work uh, in the system. And I think what I love most and, and what, I, what kind of fueled my, what I'm doing now is that every kid I feel has a different learning style. Not, not one kid has an identical learning style than the one next to it. And this school system and is just fantastic at adapting to that. Um, you know, myself personally, I have four different children that couldn't be more different from, from one to the next. And just when I, you know, I go through with one and the next one comes and they may have the same teacher and I say, okay, change your whole thought process around a Ferretti kid because this one's going to throw you for a, a, a wrench and they don't miss a beat and and truly it's it's just so um inspiring to to see the same teacher adjust seven ways to Sunday to to the students need that is in front of them and and get the same outcome um at the end of the day so that's something that just motivates me and, and drives me to, to give back in, in the way that I can as a parent, as a community member, as a school committee member. Mr. Milady. Yeah. So I, I can speak from personal experience with um, my own family, myself, as well as some of the students that I've taught, is that uh, schools can provide kids sometimes second, third, even more chances it also helps kids find their identity and find their group and make them have a place where they feel safe and valued. And I know um, this school committee and the previous school committees, when they design the middle school and the high school and when it comes budget season, I think you said, Mr. Mary, we want the kids to stay at this school, stay at the schools as long as possible so we can provide for them. And I think for, for myself, um, that's something that I take into consideration very much when it comes time to make those tough decisions come budget time. Anybody else? Mrs. Fisnick. Well, I think that um, you will hear a lot of people say, you'll read a lot of books, oh, this one person, I can point to one person mm -hmm. that influenced me or that, you know, made a huge difference. So I have my somebody, mm -hmm. um, and I think each of my children does too. So obviously my somebody's not from around here. Um, um, and, and kind of like Kelly said, each of my children is very different. <clears throat> so each of my children has a different somebody. And that gives me some amount of comfort. Uh, although, like um, Paul said, there's some children who didn't stand up at graduation. So there's a little pang there. But I think for the most part, there are places for each child. And there is somebody somewhere in the district for each child. Thank you. Um, I can just jump in and tell you I came here by accident. I went to a PTO meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and then I met Mr. Manzo out. over there who said, oh, you should volunteer. And then they were going to close the school that my children had gone to elementary school. And it was one of those really <coughs> tough times when the superintendent came to the school committee and said, we have to make $2 million in cuts. And so it came to our beloved school, 240 kids, 
you know, 18 in a classroom. There were two, two of every grade. Everybody was tight. It was like our family. And it was really difficult. And I sat at a PTO meeting and I said, how do these decisions get made without us? Where did this come from? So I ended up um, being the watchdog to the school committee. And then I met Mr. Manzo, who said, they make all the big decisions at the finance committee, so you should go there. So I ended up volunteering there. So it just evolved over the years to where I sit now. And I'm proud, proud as anything to be doing the work I do. Many of us have, you know, are working all day long, and this is not our primary role, but um, sometimes it feels like it is. I can tell you this search has felt that way. Um, but um, where was I going with that? Just to say, you know, what I've found, what I've learned is um, we do have fabulous educators and administrators in our district who cannot be compared with. And um, when I go to a curriculum instruction and in student life meeting, I see students who are engaged. I hear from our professional staff who are sitting over there who who give us presentations on programs that I would have never known about, but to see how enthusiastic they are inspires me in my day job with my children and my family and to keep doing what we're doing and to make sure that as a group we give people uh, what they need to do their job in the best way they, they can. And for me, that includes the superintendent. So, yeah. Mr. Goodwin. So I am here because of um, Sister Kathy and Sister Christine at the Carmelite Preschool in Peabody because my wife and I were both products of uh, private schools and so we sent our kids to the Carmelite Preschool over in Peabody with all in purpose, intents and purposes of sending them right along through private education. And when it got to the point, um, they both had said that you want to send your kids to school in Beverly and see how it goes from there. And we sent them to kindergarten and preschool in Beverly, and then we never looked back. Um, so it went very well and kept going very well. And so when it got time to where my kids were a little bit older and more self-sufficient, and um, a position opened up in my ward, and so I thought at that point, it's going to sound cliche, but I just kind of wanted to give back for all the great years and the great teachers and coaches um, that my children had had along the way. I was hoping to try to get involved and maybe in some small way be able to get give that back to some kids coming through after that. Mayor Cahill. Thank you, Madam President. I think the common theme is we, we all believe in our community, we all believe in our kids, and we all believe in, in the, the power of, of our public education. Uh, I'm, I'm the child of educators, I'm the child of parents who for them, education was everything. Uh, public education was everything. Uh, my dad fought his way back from parochial school in, in Dorchester as a kid and, and insisted on going to public high school and that we all would too. Um, I, I taught for a bunch of years and, and then went into, the, went into politics and got to work on educational policy issues uh, quite a bit. I think, you know, we, again, I think we all believe basically the same, the, the, the transformative power of literacy of adults who can be there to make real connections with kids. We all know that, you know, you just don't know where and how that connection's coming, but every child needs that connection, and some of them need that connection many times over. And so here's where it can happen. Mrs. Abel. Just real quickly, I'd say you make my job, or the district makes my job as a parent easier because my kids jump out of bed in the morning and they want to come to school and they want to sign up for things at school and they want to do everything uh, here in the district. It's really been wonderful as a parent to see engaged young learners. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. <laughs> um, because uh, again, I think it, uh, as Mayor Cahill pointed out, I think it just underscores um, the passion that you bring to this work and um, <coughs> really the value for, for all children um, that, that underlies the work you do. So thank you for that. Um, you know, in, in terms of a closing statement, I guess I would say um, I, 
have spent probably the last 25 years getting ready um, for, for this work. I've had um, the opportunity to be a superintendent for eight years now. Um, I, I feel well poised to lead um, a district of this caliber um, to help it advance the goals that, that it has set out. Uh, I, think, I think you're doing the right work and I would uh, be really excited about the opportunity to, to move forward in working with you and, and with the many members of the community that I've met today to serve, um, serve the children here. So I wish you well with your decision and again really appreciate the time and energy that you've put into this process. It's been, it's been a wonderful day. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'd like to entertain a that we take a recess for five minutes. So moved. Thank Second. you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? <laughs> All right. Seven to zero. It's eight twenty-eight.